Hello everyone, this is uh, Mohamed, and uh, it's my pleasure to be chairing the first talk of the master class. So for this talk, we have Professor Armin Bier, who is professor in the Johannes Kepler University in Austria, and he's also chair of the Formal Models and Verification Institute. So Armin Bier is well known for his work in formal uh, uh, methods. And throughout his career, he won many awards that will take a while to mention. So I will simply say that he is the winner of the SAT solving competition in the main track. And he also won the uh, Ishkai Jair Award in 2019. Um, so as uh, for the organization of this first talk, uh, please feel free to ask your questions in the chat. So please write them down there and I will be uh, the one, uh, I will keep them at the end of the talk to, uh, to, to present them at the very end. Uh, thank you again, Armin, for uh, accepting the invitation and we are all excited to hear about modern, um, modern techniques in SAT solving. Thank you. So I need to get allowance to share my screen. Okay. Okay, so thank you very much for, for having me. Um, so I'm struggling a little bit with this kind of um, tutorials because I've been giving them for more than 10 years. And um, the last couple of years when I did such a tutorial, I figured out that some of the, the material I had was kind of in a certain sense outdated because most people actually were learning about that in undergraduate courses and it, it probably it will be the same um, issue here but so, so I kind of uh, try to bridge this uh, gap and, and explain some basics but also um, uh, like touch upon the newest things uh, but before I do that I'll, I want to show you what SAD is about and so uh, what you see here is a sort of a simple problem um, with boolean variables and um, tie and shirt and so they only can take zero and one then you have negation disjunction um, and then we want to model, for instance, the dress code uh, of me giving this uh, master class. And then you would have these three constraints. Like first one, uh, clearly one should not wear a tie without a shirt. So tie implies shirt. Not wearing a tie on a shirt is impolite. So, so either tie or shirt. Uh, and then uh, that's my personal preference. You don't want to do both of them. So not uh, tie and shirt. So that if you do the more than you get not tie or not shirt. Now these three constraints together naturally give this um, CNF there um, at the bottom. And um, um, the question is whether this is satisfiable. So it's CNF means a formula in conjunctive normal form. And of course it's satisfiable because uh, um, I'm wearing a shirt and uh, no tie. And that's actually also the only um, uh, solution of, of this CNF. And, and I'm using this simple example also to show you why uh, it's very natural actually to use conjunctive normal form as input for, for SAT solvers and that's what uh, SAT solvers would do. So why I'm uh, we're talking about SAT, well, here's like a, actually an old picture from 2015. So my dean asked me to uh, prepare a picture of, of what I'm doing and that's like what I'm sending. And, um, but maybe more recently, um, I want to show you um, this uh, plot, so this is a um, cumulative distribution function plot. So we switched to this actually this year from cactus plot, which some, some of you also may know. So on the X axis, you see the time. And then on the Y axis, you see how many benchmarks like a certain solver uh, has solved. And um, what solvers did I list there? Well, I, I listed all the winners of the SAT competition since 2002. So um, Lima the, actually in 2002 was one of my solvers, then Precosat is also one of mine, then the two Lingelings, and then most recently my Kisat solver actually on top uh, won the competition this year. And this is um, on the competition benchmarks uh, from this year. So this plot uh, really shows that we, we saw a lot of progress in, in the last uh, 20 years. Um, maybe um, related to that, so I posted this plot on Twitter and you find like lots of discussion there. Um, and some people of you might ask, well, um, is this really um, useful in practice? Does it scale? And that's why I plotted this middle um, 
tweet here where um, uh, there was a question, how big are these instances? So, so I took the instances from this comp US competition in SAT and I plotted them down there in this GNU plot window. And the pink thing is the variable. So it goes um, over 10 to the power six. And um, um, so we clearly have um, millions of variables which are solved uh, routinely. And, and, and maybe to stress this even more, so, so there's another tweet I, I want to show you where somebody um, tried to um, verify with the bounded model check a, a neural network and he reached um, a limit in our SMT solvable lecture, which is, has, has been winning the SMT bit vector track for many years. And uh, this limit is like uh, 130 million variables, which is actually triggered by the SAT solver lingling, which is the default, which is my, my SAT solver. Uh, and uh, yeah, and uh, you would have, if they would have used or compiled it with, with another of my SAT solvers, they would not have uh, had this problem. And um, anyhow, my point is, uh, we're reaching even in SAT now the limit where 32 bit is not enough to um, index the number of variables. So we have more than 4 billion of variables. I'm also an editor of the SAT handbook, um, um, which uh, was published in 2009. And here's the list of chapters in there. So you might reference to that one that's like now 11 years old. And um, then after that in 2012, this is the SAT conference in 2012. Uh, we're, we're having, um, um, we have been contacted by Knud and Knuth who contacted the, the SAT decision, wanted to learn about SAT solving. So he's sitting there in the middle. Uh, I, I think you don't see my mouse, but um, and there are other people from the SAT community uh, around here. And then he actually came here to Linz and gave a talk in front of lots of people, played the um, Anton Bruckner origin actually. And then last but not least in 2015, published a book um, on, on SAT actually. And um, this book here is in, in reality um, a, a session. So look at the second paragraph where it says, wow, section 7.2.2.2 has turned out to be the longest section so far in this, the Art of Computer Program book series. And it's evidently, uh, SAT is evidently a killer app uh, in computer science. So it has more than 300 pages, as you see there on top. Um, now, um, you might wonder what happened since then. Actually, we're having a new edition. It's in the making, and we're like um, uh, collecting last reviews and the final versions. And there will be seven new chapters and lots of updates of existing chapters. And now we have also a quote from Donald Knuth uh, for the back cover, in addition to the quote from uh, Edmund Quarry. So this will, sh will come out probably next year. Um, then to the technical part of my talk. So um, um, you can um, think of SAT um, in these two, three sort of like processes. The first one is encoding a problem into CNF, what we kind of saw already to some extent. Then you want to simplify it, pre-process, uh, and I will cover that in other talks. So you'll find actually some of them on, on my webpage, even videos. Uh, and then at the end, you have also search. So I'll, I'll focus the second part of this talk here uh, on search. And uh, yeah, you see some errors going back from search to simplification and from simplification to encoding. And these errors um, 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 are also kind of um, important, but we, we don't really touch on, on, on them uh, in this talk. Now, let me give you a very uh, quick um, um, introduction into how to use SAT server for something interesting. So for instance, here we have like a C code on the left, an original C code, and then there's an optimized one. And through these arrows, you might go from one to the next and to the optimized one. And you want to know whether these two, the original one and the optimized code are the same. Um, we can encode this into SAT as follows. So we'll just compile this if then else away. We get a proposition formula. The trick here is to have the side effect uh, of FGH captured by a one a Boolean variable. And uh, we do this with both. And then we would ask, is it possible to make these two formula different? So like we want to find uh, variable assignments to AB and FGH such that these two formula are different. So you sort of ask the, the satisfiability of this formula, which you see there in the bottom. Um, in hardware, um, where we, we kind of can ask for the uh, same uh, problem. So the pink part on top is a circuit which is more optimized because it has only two gates, X and Y. And then on the bottom, you see a yellow circuit, which has U, V, and W. 
and uh, both of them share the inputs, um, A, B, C. And then you take the outputs, Y and W, of these two, and they feed them into a comparison. Actually, this, this is an XOR there. And this XOR uh, once asked whether it's possible to, to have a different value at the pink output and at the yellow output. And, and then O is true, otherwise not. So that can be transformed into a CNF as follows. So first of all, we localize all these constraints. So we say y, y is equal to um, B and X and X is equal to A and B. So that's what you see on the right. And don't forget that you want to set the output to, to, to true. So o, o as a unit clause is there on top. And then you need to translate this to, to a formula. And yeah, so there's like a method for doing this, but, but I think it's clear. So you can do this locally. And at the end, you just get clauses, a con conjunction of clauses. So here's like uh, here are examples for all the other um, um, for the, for all the other operators like negation, disjunction, conjunction, equivalence. We're also going to see um, if then else later. And um, but then it, you only can translate like a, a Boolean circuit, a propositional circuit into um, CNF. And what we also need is to sort of take some higher level constraints and turn them into SAT. And here I give uh, sort of sort of the most important um, sort of or most comp more complicated, the simplest complicated example, which is addition. So let's say we are adding two four bit numbers x and y, and uh, the output should be s. But so these two equations there on top. In order to do that, you would then um, t uh, instantiate this full adder circuit, which is described here at the bottom in the last three lines. You would instantiate it four times, that's in the middle and uh, with fresh variables. And what's this full letter? Well, it just takes the parity of x, y, and i, the input, and produces the, the sum output s. And then it also produces an output carry from the two inputs in the carry in. And that's kind of um, majority gate, sometimes called, or, uh, or if you look at to the right, so there's a cardinality constraint which says that at least two of them uh, should be uh, two. This actually captures then exactly a four-bit addition. Now, um, this is not also here. If you look at um, like something like an SMT server, our SMT server Google Lecture, for example, then there are lots of uh, intermediate uh, steps to get really to the SAT server here at the bottom. So you would start with some input language um, and like a SMT or a Google Lecture language, you get expressions. Then uh, you have um, O1 that's in the first uh, rectangle that's a, um, a simple bottom up rewriting. O2 you do call with substitution, then you do normalization and slicing, which can in principle um, increase the size of the formula quadratically. The other two optimizations wouldn't do that. And, and then you synthesize this into vectors of something which is called AIG. So I'll talk about this later. And, and then you optimize these AIGs on the, on the bit level, you get AIGs, and then these small circuits can be encoded with the transformation I showed you. It's called Satin transformation into CNF. And then you get, can call the SAT solver. And, and of course, like there are also back loops, which I haven't shown. Um, so there's like incremental version um, uh, through the API. Then like for arrays, you have lemmas on demand, you, and, and, and many other ways. So there are actually loops like uh, everywhere in software engineering wise, it's uh, non-trivial. Okay, so what did we see? We saw like a, a kind of a bullet two to bullet three. So we, we know how to take a four bits addition and take, translate it into a three, uh, into a, 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 like a bit level addition. And uh, then we can take this bit level circuits like in three and turn them into CNF. Um, what I haven't really described yet is like going from application level to sort of bit vectors. Um, and, and, and this need, has to be a left for, for other talks. Uh, then I'll touch upon later a little bit uh, on encoding logical constraint because this is a, a common theme. But first of all, I want to show you uh, these AIGs, which I mentioned already twice. So here's an AIG, that's an XOR between two variables. So the big circles there, they are ANDs and the small black dots, these are negations. And if you look carefully and rewrite this a couple of times, uh, applying the mark in there at the bottom, then you see, oh, this is really just an XOR between uh, X and Y. And um, this is used as intermediate language for, for uh, these solvers. Um, so here you see, um, a four bit adder, like the four bit adder we saw before would as an AIG look like the circuit on the left with four output bits. Then if you want to do this for eight bits, you, you get there to the, the right uh, and, and, and so on, right? And for 100 bits, uh, sorry, for 32 bits, you know that it, it would get like uh, maybe hundreds uh, of um, uh, such um, uh, end nodes. 
And then we can turn them into uh, CNF, as I explained. So here's like shifting. It's like a log n height uh, if you have b shift um, an n bit, bit vector. A and this is uh, a multiplication, eight by eight. So multiplication is in bit vectors doable. So you can do nonlinear reasoning easily. But for, first of all, these uh, circuits, which we hit synthesize, grow projectically in the bit width. And then, of course, because um, you cannot factor big numbers, um, there's there are limits, and actually multiplication is not easy to handle with uh, SAT solvers. Then um, to the sort of last part of this um, encoding, um, um, this taking encoding we, we saw, um, this works for most kind of um, sort of semantics of a programming language. I haven't really explained how to do a programming language, but you would just take sort of the execution of, say, a sampler program and each sampler operation would just be modeled like the addition operator we saw. And then um, this at the end gives you an like a, a simulation of the, uh, the execution of programs of real systems. What's harder are like a sort of logical properties or additional constraints, temporal uh, logic uh, encodings or fixed points. And um, as one example here at the bottom, look at this um, mutually recursive equation, which says x is equal to a or y, and y is equal to b or x. Now maybe this looks like a Boolean logic, and you can give this to the set solver, but the set solver might, for instance, just like put x and y to true, because that satisfies this, uh, these two equations, and a and b would not even matter. This, of, this would not be what you want if you have the additional requirement that your semantics dictate that, um, X, uh, that the mutual recursive um, equations here have a least fixed point. Uh, and you want, uh, in this case, uh, this, the solution would be A or B, and, and so one of them has to be uh, a true. So for instance, in the solution I mentioned before, like X and Y could both be true, but A or B false. So, so if you need to encode such logical constraints like fixed points, which are, for instance, necessary for um, temporal logic, uh, and then uh, you need to be careful. Um, or uh, maybe use a slightly different modeling um, framework like ANSA set programming, which has this least fixed point built in. Um, then um, logical constraints in are, uh, occur quite often, and um, uh, in particular these cardinality constraints here, which um, I think you are aware of. Um, uh, so they just are special cases of say pseudo boolean, which you see there at the bottom with non uh, uh, like non unit uh, coefficients. While on top they have uh, really always one as coefficients. Uh, buffer limit uh, or at least like k literals are true, or mostly k literals are are, are true, or they are exactly k. And I want to show you how to encode this into SAT with one example. This is kind of the oldest one, goes back to Shannon. Uh, so if you would have this cardinality constraint there on top, which says that the literals L1 to L9 should have at least two true and at most three true, then um, uh, how would you encode this into SAT? Well, you can, um, you can, um, um, uh, use a BDD, so binary decision diagram, so you should read this as a program, so you go from the left top and you go um, from um, L1 to L2 uh, horizontally if, if L1 is false and you go downward to L2 if uh, L1 is, is true. So whenever you go down true, like one of the literal, the literal, the question around the literal was true, if you go to the right, the, the corresponding literal is, is false. And uh, so if you now start at the top left and you go to the top right, then you will just uh, have all false and this doesn't satisfy the constraint. Same is true if you just go, went down uh, two, like if you're in the second row. And in the second row, if you then go to the right, it's still false. And uh, starting at the third row, uh, then it's true. And also at the, at the fourth row, but then again, uh, at the very bottom, um, you're just uh, going to get zero. Now this is a circuit, so you need to read sort of this as like a BDD, as an if then else in every node, and and you know now with the Zetian transformation how to get this into SAT, and uh, that's a very nice uh, polynomial and encoding. But but this is uh, not state of the art; this is just for explanation, uh, a simple way of uh, um, doing that. Like for small case, uh, that's actually uh, good, but not for big ones. Okay, I want to mention this because we hear at the uh, CP. Uh, AIOR conference uh, that this concept of R consistency actually also plays a role. And for that, let's encode uh, one of these if then else. Like what you see here is like one node uh, in this BDD. 
So if um, the output uh, is X, the input T and E, and the condition C says uh, X, the output is T if C is true, and if it's, uh, the output X is E if um, the um, C is false. And then you have these uh, th uh, three clauses in the second row there, and this is kind of a, a size-wise minimal um, encoding of this if then else. Uh, but it's not R consistent. You see this by this addition two clauses uh, at the bottom of that slide. So there, if um, the two um, um, propagations which are missing are the ones where T and E are both true, for instance, that's the one on the, le uh, on the right, uh, then the output is true um, no matter what the value of C is. And the same is true for the left one where both of them are false, if the inputs T not T and E, and then uh, the, out so the output should be uh, false. Now, uh, you could add these constraints, like because you would think uh, uh, adding, like uh, making this encoding uh, R consistent is better, but actually it's not a good idea. And the reason for that is because these three clauses are just actually implied by this formula there on top. You get them by resolving two, two clauses, like it's called ternary resolution. And the SAT solvers would actually do that. So they would uh, try to find those two clauses uh, automatically. But the difference then is that these two addition clauses are marked as redundant, so they can be ignored in certain um, situations. While you, if you as a user give these clauses, then the SAT solver would not necessarily know that they, they are redundant. So that's why better uh, not to do an R consistent encoding here. Uh, then um, I wanted to mention this bridge is the first part in the last part uh, of this talk. Um, the input format of SAT solvers. There's this DIMEX format, which is quite old already, more than 25 volts old. And if you encode the problem with the tie and shirt I mentioned beginning into this format, it would look like this. So, so you have here a header uh, comments and then a header which says two uh, uh, variables and three clauses. And then you see the three clauses. These variables are just um, uh, numbers. So like variable number one corresponds to tie and variable number two to shirt. And then a clause is terminated by zero. Then give it to the SAT server, and the SAT server would say, well, no tie and share it, like you see. And, um, but there's also like an incremental API, and I don't have much time to explain that. So we actually add, uh, added this to the sub competition, and also this year there was a track on incremental SAT sewing. At the bottom, you see AP, IPA sir, which is the name of this interface. And it has this, um, what you would call API model, where you start at unknown, then you add clauses through add, uh, then you ask the solver to solve the instance. Then on top, you if the formula is sat, you can ask for values from the solver. Or at the bottom, if the formula is unsat, then you can get uh, which of the assumptions you actually made. These are additional literals which you assume to be true um, are actually inconsistent with the rest of the formula. Uh, and then you can add back uh, new clauses uh, and new assumptions and, and start uh, over again. And here's like a C program which uses this interface and uh, here are all the uh, functions used in this one. Um, and here's like uh, the SATS or Recadical um, usage of this one. So this is pretty standardized and if you adhere to this kind of uh, conventions, you will be sure that the SATS was uh, many SATS was work for you. All right. Mm. Now let's go to the second part of the talk. So, um, more about the um, technical contents. And, and as I said before, uh, you might um, have seen this uh, before or not. So I'm not sure like I have the right level here, but forgive me if it's too uh, boring, but also maybe it, it's too fast. So, so anyhow, like um, this is very old um, technology. It goes back like to the 50s of last uh, century. And there are like two versions, one which uh, kind of eliminates variables equally and, and might explode in space. And then there's one which trades space for time. That's the sort of famous DPLL. And then there are lots of optimizations going on. And um, I can only um, explain a little bit about those. Um, uh, and uh, but first of all, let's just uh, be on the same page. What's uh, the DP procedure? That's the first one which they proposed. Davis and Putman in the 50s. Well, it's just you see this loop there, and this this loop just continues forever until either the formula is completely empty. That's the first line, and then it's satisfiable. Or you find an empty clause, like bottom is in the formula, then it's unsatisfiable. Otherwise, we pick a variable and add our resolvents on this variable. And then the last part is actually a tricky one. Then we're allowed uh, to uh, remove all clauses in which X and not X occur. 
And this um, is not used anymore in this form to solve formulas, but it's like one of the most important um, preprocessing errors we have in, in SATSOM. Usually this would remove like 80% of the variables. So if, if I would have now more time, like in a lecture, I would actually show this on real examples, but you should uh, actually check this out yourself. And this comes now under the, the name bounded variable elimination. Now the um, the problem with this previous algorithm was that it exploits in space. So, because the number of um, uh, resolvents is confetic in the formula, and so you add like confetic many resolvents all the time, and that's like uh, very, very expensive. Now, that's why they, um, in the 50s already, they came up with this recursive algorithm, DPLL, which uh, adds uh, to the mix something which you would probably call bounding. So, you do some Boolean constraint propagation, and then uh, the same tests as before. Um, otherwise, if you're not done yet, well, then you pick a variable which still occurs, and um, then you call the the solver um, the, the procedure recursively once with this literal um, added and once with its negation added. And if both of them are unsat, then uh, then the whole problem is uh, unsat. Otherwise, if one of them is sat like this next to last line, then you're already done. So you you can uh, finish here uh, early. Um, to show this as an example, well, here's a search tree. So on the right, you see a formula out of eight clauses. These are actually all eight clauses over three variables. And each clause rules out exactly like one assignment. So the first one, the blue one, rules out that A, B, C are all true because that would falsify the clause. And you sort of see this also as the conflict here. Um, sorry. And then if you would start the search, you would pick a decision, let's say A, make A true, then another decision, the next black dot that B is true, and then the blue dot there where BCP is written. This would use this clause which is discussed uh, and realize, okay, A and B are true, so C has to be false. Okay. Um, so this is not a decision, this blue um, assignment of uh, not, not C. But then uh, the second clause is actually false. And because of that, we have to backtrack. And uh, in this particular case, DP uh, will uh, take these four leaves. Now, um, there was a big breakthrough in the 90s. It kind of started the new um, age of the SAT solvers. And we would call it now conflict-driven clause learning. Well, actually, this, this term was coined later. Um, and, and what's also important, this is to, like the outcome of the thesis of Marke, Joao Marque Silva and um, uh, with, his, uh, with Karen Sakala as his supervisor and led to this uh, SAT solver grasp. So one thing which you might not be um, aware of is that all these usages of SMT solvers in many applications really um, relies on, on this idea that you have sort of lemmas and in, in SMT, uh, these lemmas are generated not only by the SAT solver, but also by the theory. And um, one important part here is that you have this uh, learning as, uh, of, of no goods as clauses, and I'll explain that in a minute. Um, and then another invention there was this notion of implication graph, which I was going to explain, and also first unique imp uh, implication points. So first of all, uh, how does conflict during clause learning le work? Well, it looks like the same as before. So this slide is almost like a part of the previous DPLS slide, except now that when we get into this the same conflict as before, we realize, oh, we cannot be in this part of the search space. So what did we do? Well, we pick A and B as decisions, as assumptions. And so that means uh, we cannot have A and B to be true at the same time. Okay, this is a no good, and this no good actually becomes this yellow clause here at the bottom. So we learn the clause not A or not B. And the cool thing now is, well, this is a clause. So it's in the same input format as your um, original problem. So we're kind of working with the same uh, data structures here. Um, anyhow, so I see we see this clause, and now uh, we'd say, uh, okay, wait a minute. If I would have had this clause before, at the point where I made the decision B, Okay, so the, the, the second black dot here from the uh, top, then I cannot, um, I would not uh, actually make the decision B, but I would immediately set uh, B to false because uh, A is true. And then this clause says if A is true, then B has to be false. So, and that's like what this picture would give you. So we would actually, after making decision A, immediately derive not B by this new learned clause, which is this blue one. Uh, and then afterwards, we do another decision, another propagation by this uh, green clause that would give not C. And again, we would get a conflict, the red clause. Uh, and um, 
again learn uh, a clause. Now the learn is a, the clause, the learn clause is degenerated because it's just a unit because we only made one um, one decision and it's not possible to have this decision uh, together with the formula. So we'll just learn the unit and then we would even uh, jump back to the top uh, of the search, and then pick another decision. Uh, and then at the very end, uh, after learning another unit clause, learn the empty clause. So this is how, how um, uh, CDCL works. As I said, the second invention back then was this implication graph. And here's, I have an example. So this is kind of capturing um, uh, how you use clauses to write new um, uh, values. So here, the T uh, is set to true at decision level four, at the lowest level or the, the highest decision level, if the other one, D, G, and S are all true. And that corresponds to this implication in the bottom or like this clause. Uh, we also have here a conflict. This conflict co corresponds to this um, uh, binary clause, which says as Y and Z cannot be true at the same time. So this is an encoding in a sense. It's very simple to implement because you would just need to record for each um, like assigned um, variable a pointer to the clause which forced it to, to true and then maybe like some pseudo pointer for the conflict. Now what we will do with this is we'll take like for instance the conflict clause here, this blue one, and uh, resolve it with its reason which is this clause there uh, well, in, in pink, but in the, with the blue background. And the, the nice uh, situation here is that in one of them, Y is true, in the other one, Y is uh, uh, negated. So they have to be uh, resolvable and we can resolve them and get this new clause. This new clause corresponds to this cut. And actually we can abstract this cut again to a new clause, which is implied by the formula. And we can, can continue doing this uh, until we get to this point here where we kind of uh, learned an important clause. This is called the first UIP clause. So this clause has the um, property that's the first clause. If you continue doing this uh, topologically reverse um, uh, resolutions, which uh, has only one literal on the, on the highest decision level left. And, and in this particular case, we know that, okay, so we should not have, if we would have known this clause, like in the example before, uh, um, then we should not actually do a decision on this decision level four. No, we should have used that clause to propagate this value of S. And in particular, this example is instructive because it even tells us this does not happen at decision level three. This even happens at the back jump level decision two. So with this implication graph and analysis I just showed, you get uh, something which uh, was pre uh, invented before in the CP context, which was called back jumping, but you, you, you completely get this for free if you have this uh, implication graph. This is the idea of back jumping uh, on an abstract level. Okay, now uh, why not um, sort of uh, resolve uh, one more step? So we could take the, the, um, the reason for S being true, namely that L and R are true. This is the pink clause at the bottom above the line uh, to the left. And uh, yeah, we could do that, uh, but then we would, and that's kind of, we would pull in this decision level three because now L will be also part of the yellow clause at the bottom. And then we cannot back jump to decision level two. Okay, so this first UIP clause is special because it uh, kind of is optimal in the sense that it doesn't pull in uh, these uh, redundant decision levels, it keeps them uh, at a minimum. Okay, that they, people would call its last UIP, so that's why we would do this uh, first UIP clause. Uh, and then maybe like uh, very fast, uh, you can actually minimize this clause. So if you look at the variable i here on the top right, you see that the only reason for i is that uh, that h is is true, and and so we have this clause uh, not h or y i, and and this clause of course can be resolved against the learn clause, the first year p clause we derived before, and um, actually it results in just removing the i from that clause. So we get a shorter clause, the one, the yellow one and the, with the yellow background at the bottom. Um, but we can do even more minimization here. The H here, which you see sticking out here on the right, it depends on E and E depends only on this top level unit D and also on this decision, uh, on decision level one. But this D is already uh, negated in the learn clause. So that's why we can also remove the, the H and at the end, we'll just get a ternary clause and that's the one we would learn. Uh, also note again that we can still back jump to decision level two. Okay, this brings me to another like more um, well-known um, um, situation. 
and uh, this is um, the invention of, of VSITs, variable, um, uh, uh, variable uh, uh, state independent sum, heuristic VSITs for short, which was invented in Princeton by Moskovich, Mendeven, uh, Chang, and uh, uh, of course uh, Malik. And uh, this one is, uh, um, uh, is sort of another milestone which is very important for the success of the SAT solvers. And um, <clears throat> like the uh, two Niklas from the mini SAT solver, Niklas Jön and Niklas Sörensen actually uh, invented a very important uh, optimization on top of that. I would, I called it like um, exponential VSITs. And um, I'm, I'm, we produced a survey in 2015 which, which kind of, um, looks through the history of these decision heuristics. And then there's even all the decision heuristics which are like important look ahead. This is probably more closer to what people would do in CP solvers. And, um, but in SAT, this is mostly useful only for, for like a hard combinatorial problems in, in parallelization, like in our con loop and conquer approach. So I want to um, show you now um, this uh, variable move to front a little bit more closer because that actually um, gives you some benefit. And the basic idea of this variable move to front is as follows. Uh, let me go back to this picture. So here you see that D, G, and S are important because they, they kind of learned. And that's why in, in the solvers you would bump them. So you would give them more um, relevance uh, for, for future decisions. So you would put them in a priority queue uh, or in, and, and then always use like those which, which were used more frequently. And the most uh, simple way of doing that is a move to front a queue. So you have a double um, linked queue in which you put all the variables and then as soon as you find some variables which became important, you, you bump them, you take them out and you put them to the, to the far right and um, then later you search through it. So here I have an example. Um, so um, you need like this next search point of which tells you which is the variables uh, you want to um, use as decision next and the invariant of this data structure is that uh, to the right of this next search all variables are assigned and now if you're uh, unassigned a variable like this nine you'll need to sort of move this next part and you can do this very fast by making by adding these timestamps to each variable which tells you sort of uh, when was a variable enqueued on this uh, queue. And now if you bump, for instance, four and it remains um, um, uh, assigned to false because it's uh, in the learn clause and it's just put to the right and the next search point doesn't change. So this trick with this next search and these timestamps allows you to implement this variable move to front very fast. And then this is now default in, in some solvers like my solvers for one part of um, searching. Um, Okay, here's like a whole list of this, but I refer to the paper if you want to go through that. Now this gives then um, a basic CDCL loop and that was kind of uh, there in, in, in Zhao's work in like 20 years ago. Um, um, however, like the two important things and those are also things which are more recent, uh, which, which you need in order to really make this uh, work and fast. And the first one is reducing learn clauses. If you keep learning these clauses, your, your database will just get bigger and bigger and uh, Boolean constraint propagation will uh, bog down. And um, therefore, um, you need to throw some away. Um, and here the current state of the art is based on the Sitchkai paper by, by Odmara and Simon, um, which um, compute the number of decisions levels in this learn clause. And um, um, if a class has few uh, decision level, then it's considered good, and they showed this also experimentally. And, and moreover, if you have really small um, glucose level classes, then you actually keep them forever. Then uh, Chan Sek Oh came up with a, sort of a variant of this then, where you actually would uh, have uh, distinguished three levels of, um, of such uh, glucose levels. The first one, like up to two, will be kept forever. Then between two and six, you will keep them around uh, much or more often. Uh, much, uh, and then the last ones are just uh, uh, throw, thrown away. Okay, this is um, uh, like part of uh, recent uh, research. And then the other thing, which is also, uh, uh, the idea is older, and, uh, but it's like uh, the recent, most recent, inventions they are less than 10 years old. This is restarts. And basically originally restarts were invented to um, from, from uh, motivation of a local search where you sort of, you don't want to get stuck in sort of like one part of the search tree where you, there's like really no solution. That's why you want to jump to some other place. 
Um, actually, uh, and that's really surprising, also surprising for me, uh, that's uh, not really the, the motivation here anymore. So uh, um, today, uh, actually, restarts are used, uh, are important for unsatisfiable formulas. So you need to re restart actually very frequently, usually even maybe even every second or third conflict. Uh, if you want, if your formula is unsat, and, and the reason for that is it, you need to freeze sort of variables in order to find short proofs. Well, for satisfiable restart, uh, for formulas, it's the opposite. You should not uh, restart often, maybe um, quite uh, reluctantly, and I'll talk about this reluctantly in a minute. Um, and because of that, Chancek O in his thesis um, uh, proposed to interleave these two phases of uh, many restarts, like very frequent, like every third, third or second uh, um, a, a conflict and these um, um, phases in where you don't uh, really restart called stabilizing or um, mode or stabilizing phases. So this was the um, original proposal in around 2010 where um, this is the schedule for restarts. So on the x-axis you see the number of uh, restarts and then on the y-axis you see the number of conflicts waiting um, until you do a next uh, restart. And this is kind of increasing uh, exponentially, but um, uh, 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 reluctantly. So that means um, um, uh, you go back to sort of like a, a restart interval of one once in a while, but the end, you like you start off with two, four, eight, and then on the very right, you have like a, a 32. Um, uh, this would be the code for doing that. Donald Knuth came up with some much more elegant version of computing this function. And as I said before, um, uh, today um, it's uh, advisable to use this uh, um, Luby restart scheme uh, only for the stable phase with not many uh, restarts and um, uh, use like restart much more often uh, before. And in that other, um, uh, uh, you would, in this more focused mode where you target unsatisfiable formula, the, the state of the art is this, um, uh, this uh, paper by um, uh, also by Audemars and Simon on on uh, using exponential moving averages for the, uh, the, for, for um, uh, triggering restarts and um, since I'm running out of time I, I think I'll I'll uh, skip the explanation of this one if you have questions ask later. All right, then there's something which is important recently. Also in 2007, um, Not and Davic found had this idea of phase saving. So you should do restarts, but then actually you should not really completely restart in the sense of like picking new values for decisions. You actually should remember what you tried last time and then uh, use the same phase for a variable. And only then you can afford to use this, uh, have these rapid restarts or very frequent restarts we talked about. Now, more recently, we showed that uh, this can be actually made um, or can be made even more extreme, this view, uh, by just saving the whole assignment uh, tr uh, trail uh, and um, then always um, kind of maximizing, trying to maximize the trail with, without a conflict. And that gives actually even better results uh, than this um, uh, phase saving. Then this gives you a kind of this, um, uh, CDCL solver, where again you have um, restarting and reducing insight and also decisions. Now, if you go one step further, uh, this is what I just uh, downloaded from uh, GitHub of our SATS or Recadical. Then there's like lots of other things in there, and like uh, they mostly related to um, pre processing and in processing, which I explained at the very beginning. I don't have time to explain here. And, um, but this makes also the solver much more complicated and also much more complicated to get right. Then on the low level side, there's also an important part which uh, was invented uh, um, originally or, or, or the, the idea uh, for this invention was originally Nesado sat solvers. And uh, so, so they figured that um, it's actually enough to watch exactly two literals in a solver without losing kind of art consistency when you look at clauses as constraints. And um, so you don't need to watch like uh, all the literals. And that's important because this learning produces very long clauses. And if you like watching them all, you spend, um, you not only have lots of memory, but you also spend lots of time uh, visiting these clauses without uh, uh, being necessary. And uh, 
this um, can be improved by blocking literals and, and there's also like a technique uh, uh, which described by Ian Gent, which avoids like um, a quadratic corner case. So here are things we did not discuss. As I said, like no, no advanced pre-processing and in-processing. And, and as uh, Mohammed said, like we got this uh, a nice Ichkai uh, um, JR award for, for the best uh, article in chair for in the last five years. And this was about this pre-processing, you might want to read that. And also the Benjamin thesis, um, Benjamin Kiesel's thesis um, actually talks about more theoretical aspect of pre-processing. Then another like thing which happened in recent years is proof. So Marijn Hoyle uses this proof of sets for so really um, uh, in, uh, or open mathematical problems, like more recently the Kolatz conjecture. And um, that's also related to proof complexity. So we had actually a couple of seminars where we met with uh, proof complexity um, people on uh, in Banff. I mean, when I say we, I mean like more pra practitioners in SAP. And uh, the Dutch tool this year, un unfortunately, had to be canceled. Then, of course, there are lots of uh, extensions. And so next masterclass talk will be about MaxSAP. Then one thing I want to mention here is that local search was uh, really something which improved considerably in SAP solving the last years. And um, also our uh, target phases I previously uh, touched upon really goes into this direction, sort of merging local search and, um, um, and, and CDCL. So there are some challenges, like er there's no arithmetic reasoning on the bit level. And um, uh, I've been working with my PhD stu student, Daniela Kaufmann on this one. And um, uh, also one in, in not in interesting development is um, chronological backtracking invented or like discovered, rediscovered by two colleagues from Intel. And uh, we're working on this one um, also. And um, yeah, last but not least, there's like also not, things have not been completely, are not completely settled with respect to incremental solving, even though my student, Katalin, uh, actually made a, a big improvement um, um, last year. And uh, last but not least, of course, uh, parallel and duplicit sat is extremely difficult. And uh, there's a, now a handbook of parallel constraint reasoning, but like there are many open problems there, which I was not able uh, oops, to discuss. So last slide here, uh, this is a personal history of sat solvers. And you see lots of these um, things I touched uh, in this uh, um, the talk. Um, and uh, yeah, maybe I'll leave that up for, for, for question. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Armin. That was impressive. That was very interesting. Um, so, so far there is no question in the chat. So feel free to ask. We have a few minutes. Um, in the meantime, maybe I take advantage and uh, I ask my very own questions. Yes. Um, so I always wondered if there are theoretical reasons where, um, when should we use restarts? What kind of restart should we use? Should we do them frequently and frequently, this kind of stuff? So yeah, you mentioned in some cases in unsatisfiable formulas, somehow uh, we should use uh, frequent restarts and then in satisfiable uh, formulas we should use, uh, we, should, uh, we should avoid restarts. I mean, there's like one answer from the proof complexity community. So CDCL um, simulates um, um, a rec uh, like a general resolution with restarts. So there's a proof that you need restarts for, um, for doing that. And, and, and that's kind of uh, um, uh, fits well to this code of more practical observation that for, for some, uh, for these unsat proofs to find, for unsatisfied formula to find the proofs, in particular short proofs, it seems you really want to frequently restart. And um, so it's, it's really like uh, the default uh, restart interval in my solvers is actually two or five conflicts, right? While for, um, for the sort of this uh, satisfiable phases, it's thousand. Uh, um, uh, on the other hand, um, it's unclear on the satisfiable formulas. We don't have a theory like proof complexity for satisfying assignment, or it's just like not much theory, let me put it this way. And, and there we don't really know the answer. There's no theory answer for, for that part. Okay. Uh, so we have a question uh, by uh, Roland Yap, and he's asking, is the local search only for satisfiable formulas? Uh, well, yes and no. So like uh, we had like um, uh, two papers on something which we call satisfaction driven close learning, SDCL, SDCL and
solver, and if the solver says sat, so we use a, a sat solver as a sat oracle. If the solver says sat, we can actually learn that the current branch can be abandoned because we kind of, it's like without loss of generality, we can actually skip this part of the search and jump to some, some other part. But in principle, beside that, I haven't seen any, any local search um, being used for, for unsat. Okay, more questions coming. Uh, so a question by Amir and he's asking, given that SAT solvers may have several phases and strategies within a single solver that alternate during the search, does this make the SAT solver somewhat of a portfolio solver? Well, um, to a certain extent, yes, but, if the, portfolio, but the portfolio is synergetic. Uh, so because if you learn something in one part, you will actually use it in, in the other part. Um, then the, the, um, the, it, it's, it's a very tight integration. So it's not like uh, the same what you would get if you would run sort of these solvers uh, independently. Okay, another question. Um, so the next question is, where do you see such solvers going in the following years? Yes, I said, like I'm actively working on arithmetic uh, reasoning. So this is useful for cryptographic applications and also for, for, um, uh, for, circuit, my, for, for um, sorry, for arithmetic circuit verification where we still have issues. And um, it also bridges a little bit the sort of the gap to the constraint reasoning. So there's like, um, how do we um, sort of use more structure within a SAT solver? And you will always tackle it from both sides. So you put more, more um, sort of brain into the top uh, higher level everything, but you might also put more into lower level. Then of course, parallel is unsolved. So I don't know, uh, we're actively working on, on parallel. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Michael is asking, is the large number of literals and clauses in some uses of SAT, of SAT? Inherent. Uh, oh, this, 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 goes, this goes into the same direction. The, you see the beauty of this, uh, the CNF is I mentioned it in the example. So if you take, um, well, I think I, um, I didn't show it in this slide, but if you, for instance, have a multiplier with uh, over 32 bit, which is what your 32 bit processor would do, then you need like 8,000 um, AIG nodes to capture that. But it's then um, already pretty uh, large CNF for, for, um, for 64 bit, it's like 32,000 AND nodes. Uh, so you're just wasting sort of like 13,000 nodes uh, or little variables just for one multiplication. Uh, on the other hand, this would solve, give you like the, the ability to solve uh, a nonlinear uh, um, uh, problems um, precisely, which other formal listens would not do. Uh, and then, of course, uh, you saw it in the plot, in the GNU plot, we can do uh, millions of variables. So this kind of works. And so I don't see a hindrance to continue this way. Of course, uh, when, we, when I talk about like our approach for arithmetic reasoning, we're using computer algebra. So like we go outside of um, uh, a CNF, uh, but like uh, sort of bridging the two worlds, that's the interesting part I'm working on. Okay. So Kiran is asking, is CNF still the best input format or is it just used for historical reasons? Yeah, I asked myself this question too, but for 20 years, but now of course I'm used, so used to it. No, it's, it's really true. So, so nobody has really shown that you can do much. I mean, I showed you the architecture of, uh, of Boolector and the architecture is beca because of the reason you're, you're, you're saying here. So like for some of the parts, like for instance, structural hashing of like common sub expression elimination, uh, you don't want to do this on a CNF level. Actually, uh, C uh, SAT solvers are bad at that. And, and uh, so that's also why you need this like software engineering wise uh, back a uh, really difficult loop. Um, and, um, but still um, it's way more effective. And then maybe you also appreciate this point of, well, you have the same input format as, you as is your learning. And this really gives you a, a huge advantage. So, so I would claim this is a factor of three. And uh, so whenever you try to do something more clever and the first thing you have to do, get like of improve by a factor of three, you will have an issue. Okay. We have another question by Roland and he's asking, are the hard random instances useful for modern sets? Yes, uh, so, so I couldn't elaborate on that one, but the breakthrough uh, in local search, in my view, happened also with uh, PropSat uh, around 2012, which was originally only targeted towards um, random formula 
But then it turned out that this over, uh, solved some instances in the uh, craft, crafted track of the sub-competition. Now the top three performing uh, solvers of this uh, competition, including my solvers, all have a random um, solver in it, like a local search solver, um, which you'd use it in a certain way, like actually it kind of improves the face saving. And um, so in order to win the competition, you probably want to have a local search solver in, in, in it. Um, and these were all motivated by the research on, on random instances. So yes. Very good. So maybe a question by myself again. Um, so I always wondered if there is a particular reason why such solvers are well known to use uh, problem and dependent heuristics. So we rarely see such solver used for an instance where you say, okay, for this problem use this very problem specific heuristic. Yeah, I also, uh, this is also a very good question. Of course, like what happens quite often is that some people send me the instance and, and ask you, I mean, can you try uh, and uh, get your solver improved on that one? But it then it turns out that so over the years, we, we, we have so much experience in sort of getting to this uh, problem agnostic um, uh, in, uh, heuristics, which really often work out of the box. This is actually also something which uh, which changed uh, in around like uh, 2000. So before, like in the domain, I'm, I was mostly working on hardware verification, people used BDDs, and there you have really had to sort of be expert and use the BDDs in a certain way. And uh, um, always uh, really just, it was kind of a manual uh, uh, way of doing verification. This completely changed uh, around 20 years ago in SMT and SAT, and it continues to change. That's just my point. So, and we're not there yet. But at the end, of course, like if you do these math proofs of Marine Hoy, you need also specific um, insights and uh, use the solvers in a specific way. So it's um, most of the time, I would say, yes, you don't need like, spe like um, specific heuristics, but yeah. Okay, another question. And I think we are uh, almost uh, at the end of the talk. Um, how good would decomposition methods work in SAT solving? As processing and or in the search. Oh, I can't read it. So it's no. oh, decomposition word in that song. Yeah. Uh, actually, um, decomposition, uh, the Cube and Conquer approach is a kind of uh, decomposition because it splits on the top, sort of like similar to what you would do in CP or in the AI search in general, like doing sort of global decisions and then trying to get sort of independent uh, decomposed problems uh, um, at the bottom. Then within the SAT server itself, we have a couple of um, like pre-processing techniques, which also take use of uh, completely independent sub-problems. And uh, also there's like, um, like a, a detecting uh, components and equivalent literals. Okay. Uh, so for time reasons, I invite everyone to maybe move to the next room because we have the uh, second talk that should start soon. So we have the other different uh, Zoom link. And whoever want to ask many, uh, maybe one or two more questions uh, to finish the talk. But before finishing, I would like to thank uh, Armin again because he has another talk later today in a different in a, in a different uh, conference and uh, different talk even. So thank you very much, Armin, for the talk. That was thank you good. for the pleasure. And if you have any uh, questions on the material, uh, please let me know. Thank you. Okay, maybe I finish with the one question of Tobias. He's asking, what about other frameworks besides CDCL, like Tableau methods? Well, well, Tableau, um, also in first order theorem proving, are not uh, as efficient as resolution. And um, um, I would say, yeah, I also looked at that. So it's similarly related to the previous question on sort of non-CNF inputs because Tableau should look, look sort of more applicable to say structural formulas, but everything I tried fails. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Armin.